Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm still Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. Over the years, I've uh, interviewed several people with regard to filmmaking. Some with regard to getting filmmakers to come to El Paso and produce films, in other cases to show films, such as the Plaza Classic Film Festival. I've had interviews on that. I decided for today to have someone here, Jay Duncan, who is a leader of the Sunset Film Society, I believe is what it's called. And I met him recently at an event, and he talked about Artivinos for some reason. So we're going to find out from Jay about showing films here, uh, Sunset Heights area and at Artivinos. Am I correct, Jay? Well, it's, it's exclusively now at the uh, Artivinos Desert Crossing location okay. in Sunland Park, New Mexico. Uh, but backing up a bit, in August of 2013, um, we had access to a historical home in Sunset Heights. And it was 1909, I think, when it was built. It was the W.H. Hickson House, okay. a prominent El Pasoan who was a prominent jeweler and so forth, and uh, a leading citizen in early El Paso around the turn of the century. And so at the time, we thought, Let's develop a film society. In addition to it, eventually, we, our hopes were to becoming a bed and breakfast, which would have been nice proximity to the university, oh, the downtown, and so forth. And so we thought, let's, let's do this. Let's have a monthly uh, film, classic film, uh, in this 109-year-old home. And I thought, what would be the f appropriate to kick this off? And I thought, hmm, what's, what's a good setting? Uh, for a 1909 with the, the original leaded glass windows and the hardwood floor and the parquet tile right. and everything. And I thought, somewhere in time, uh, which was set, of course it opens in contemporary Chicago, 1980, when the film was made. But the primary uh, storyline is 1912, Christopher Reeve, Jane Seymour. And so that was our kickoff film. Um, in August of 2013. And it was interesting because it was um, probably had between 35 and 40 people, a little cozy, you know, even with the large living room space and extending back out of it into the, uh, the foyer and so forth. But it worked because I think they were feeling the atmosphere uh, that was depicted in the film because they were in they it. They could look around at the house. Yeah. yeah, oh absolutely. A lot of the original furnishing and so forth. And so you know, uh, we thought we're on to something. Let's do this once a month. Let's pick a classic film. Um, you know, uh, all genres represented and, um, and see what happens. And so coming up March of 2015 will be our 20th presentation. Um, but now it's at the uh, Artivino's Desert Crossing in uh, Sunland Park. Now interesting, and tell me if, if if this is a sign or what. Back in April, when we first moved to Artivino's, because we'd kind of outgrown the original space. Okay, here we are in uh, April. February of 2015, so right. that kind of puts it in perspective right. for the audience. Right, so in April of 2014, um, when I had talked to Marina and Robert Artivino, and we had a green light to go ahead with this, uh, they said, okay, uh, we're gonna, you're gonna be in the Sunset Hall which is the banquet facility at Artivino's. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, Sunset Film Society in the Sunset Hall. Yeah. Why not Sunset Boulevard to kick it's it off? It's a natural. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was just a, a sign that we couldn't, we couldn't pass up. So that was, our, that was our premiere presentation in April of 2014. And of course, now we're coming up on the first anniversary that we, uh, we have been at, at Artivino's Desert Crossing. Okay, how do you make a living? You don't just make a living showing films. No. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've, um, throughout, throughout our lifetimes, we, we, we kind of change positions from right, time to time. Right. Um, so I was involved in the television industry as a program director at, and, um, at three of the, of the five local TV stations. Mm -hmm. um, but the industry's changing. 
they don't really have program directors anymore because it's all programmed by the network, basically. Mm -hmm. you, you flip a switch, and if you have a hit show, that, that's good. If you don't, you can't do much about it. You kind of live with it. Right. But in the 80s, um, I had a chance to be program director at El Paso's only inter, um, uh, independent station, which was KCIK, mm -hmm. which is now KFOX, Channel 14. Right. And so, you know, after the change uh, so much and going in different directions, I thought, uh, what can I do to where I'm not kind of so dependent on the flakiness of the industry, right. you know? And so in uh, August of 2008, I thought, do I have anything of value that I can maybe sell? Um, even though I kind of hated to because I'd been acquiring it through the years since I was a teenager. But it was uh, vintage movie memorabilia. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the 60s, you could pretty much, um, you know, get things from the 40s, 50s, certainly, yeah. uh, at a reasonable price because there wasn't really a market for that. And right. of course, that's changed. There was no eBay or anything like that. No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And of course, I had this accumulation of stuff that I began collecting uh, for my collection. But I thought, hmm, I hate to let some of it go, but seeing what some of it is going for mm -hmm. and having a friend that could do high resolution digital negatives to where I could really maintain the image in the original size, mm -hmm. um, it was like, like selling off the original but keeping a archival museum quality reproduction. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. And then I would feed what I could make off, and this was through um, the auction house, you know, Heritage Auction House, uh, one of the world's leading uh, representatives for movie memorabilia in Dallas, mm -hmm. uh, through their signature auctions, through their weekend auctions and so forth, you know, um, they would promote it properly, like oh, 250,000 members and so forth, you know, so you could, you could get, uh, in the signature, you get the catalog you know, that showed, you know, high quality color reproductions right. of all the items that they're being offered that quarter. Um, they had weekend auctions, internet only. You could, uh, you could bid by mail, you could bid by phone. And um, I thought, man, if you can reach a quarter of a million people, uh, you don't mind letting them take 20% mm -hmm. of whatever it goes for. And you could set limits, you could, you could, um, you could either do that or not. Uh, like um, a minimum that you want. And so anyway, it, was, it worked out successfully and I was able to put some of the, you know, live, of course, you know, keep the wolf from the door, but then reinvest into trying to find additional pieces that I could put on auction. We want to give you a chance then to put a telephone number up and a website. To, over the years, I've had some people stop me and say, I want to be on your show. And I'd mm -hmm. say, what? Well, I sell real estate. Yeah. I said, well, no, I'm not there to promote businesses. Sure. But I invited you here to talk about movie making as this is how you make a living. Mm -hmm. We want you to give a, a chance to have a, a number up there and a website. Well, Maybe somebody I, will come I in and say, that. I want to buy something from you. Yeah, you know, and, and, and you know, people in, in their effects and in estates sometimes, they have things that they're either sick <laughs> of looking at mm -hmm. or they wonder, why am I keeping this or right. what's it worth? And so I'd be happy to do an appraisal. Um, if they're willing to sell, I'd be happy to make an offer, you know. But yeah, um, my telephone number is, is here in El Paso, area code 915-532-1348. And our website for the Sunset Film Society, and certainly you could reach me that way as well. Um, and there's, a, there's a, an opportunity to send me an email directly. Uh, is sunsetfilmsociety.org. Okay. Okay. This is only a 30 minute program. We could sure. talk for a long time. Sure. Let me ask you this question. Yeah. What is your favorite movie of all time? And then I'll mm -hmm. tell you my favorite movie. Well, that's, that's always been a puzzler in a sense because we, we, we sometimes have favorite movies for different reasons or, or maybe a favorite genre. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you the, the film that really got me enthused about film. And, and history of film and filmmaking. Um, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit and say that, uh, that I was small. I was in the back seat of a car. My mom and dad were in the front and we were at a drive-in. And I remember like this, watching this film and just being totally enraptured by it. 
and maybe not uh, totally getting all the ramifications of the plot, mm -hmm. but thinking that this was something special. And that was the day the earth stood still with Michael Rennie and Patricia Neal. And that was about something from outer space, a yeah. round spaceship. It lands on the mall in Washington, D.C. Yeah, okay. And of course, the first reaction is to shoot him, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they realize that, uh, that he came to present a gift to the president. Uh, with this, you know, diseases could be conquered and so forth. So it was nearly like, uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a Christ parallel, parable in a sense. Um, there's a Judas, you know, there's, uh, there's a Christ-like figure in Klaatu. Um, but I remember thinking, now, this is quite special, and I remember it was another 10 years before I saw it again, and it was the premiere presentation on NBC Saturday Night at the Movies. Wow. And I thought, oh man, this is going to be exciting because how much of this is accurate in my memory, you know? And, and, and a lot of it really was. It had made an impression, and especially the ending, where you feel that the sanest man on the planet is not of this world, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, he comes, he delivers an ultimatum, and then eventually, eventually it's a warning, um, you know, be, we'll be waiting for your answer, you know, either live with us and live in peace or face your present course and face obliteration, you know? It's kind of like one of those deals. Well, well I see that you brought a poster. This yeah. is not from that movie, but no. there's a spacecraft. <laughs> That's right. You're still playing around with spacecraft. I am. I, you know, and, and of course, I think in addition to that, and me creating a, um, a, a lifelong love for the science fiction film, we had an opportunity back in 2003, we meaning me and then eventually Charles Horak, and we partnered and we thought, wouldn't it be fun if we had something at the Chamazal National Memorial? And we were both huge 50s science fiction fans and we thought, what about it came from the 50s, show Ten movies, no re repeats, over the Memorial Day weekend, and invite guests that appeared in some of these films. And of course, you know they're in their 80s, right. you know, because this is 50 years later. They were generally 20, 30 years old, and so this was our <laughs> this was our uh, second one. We did four, five, six, and seven. This was from 2005. And what's interesting about this one, I think, is that if people look at the buildings here, they'll see that this is El Paso. <laughs> you know, it's been reconfigured via Photoshop, but there, you know, the old Palace Theater and, and you know, the, the Bassett Towers and so forth. And uh, a lot is going on in that photograph. <laughs> you know, you don't know which way to run. Oh uh, people being sucked up into the ray of the flying saucers, Godzilla holding a car, breathing fire. And all of these That's are El Pasoans, and we have a little cameo Charles Horak, Jay Duncan here, oh, <laughs> via a la Hitchcock, um, to be among the, the hysteria. So so we went four years, and uh, we went from like eight sponsors, corporate sponsors, in uh, the year before this. I think there's 13 or something the second year, and by the fourth year we had like 23, because what's not to like? It's That's a safe right. haven. Um, so the baby boomers loved it. Their kids and their grandkids uh, came because they said, oh, I've always heard of the creature from the Black Lagoon, but I've never seen it. Well, we showed it in 3D. We showed it uh, War of the Worlds, The Day the Earth Stood Still, coincidentally. Uh, invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, Forbidden Planet, and a lot of the biggies. And the first year we thought, well, we'll do it once. We don't know. You know, if we get 30 people, we'll be, we'll be thrilled. And we had like, I don't know, 2,750 for the weekend and some sellouts. And of course, sellout in the, in the sense that the, the seat was taken since it was a free event because of the corporate sponsorship. Yeah, right. We didn't charge, it was free parking. So it was first come, first serve. And um, uh, the people loved it. it and worked. then about 2000, and I was planning on the fifth one, which was gonna really be big and special. Then we had the recession and so uh, we kind of cooled it, and in that period, the Plaza Theater, of course, had reopened in 2006 with Riverdance, and Charles Horak had been talking to the Community Foundation people right. about the possibility of maybe doing not this, but something on a vast scale over a 10, 11-day period, 80 movies or something, 
and not knowing what to expect. And of course that was in 2008 and here we are approaching the 8th Plaza Classic Film Festival, which will be coming up in August. Well, I've had Charles and I've had Eric Pearson from that Absolutely. activity there. I'm going to tell you about my favorite movie and then the scariest movie I ever watched, The okay. Game of Nightmares. My favorite movie now is The Lion King. Okay. And my theme song for my American government classes is, is I Just Can't Wait to Be King. Remember, I teach government <laughs> and politics, okay? So it's appropriate. It used to be Fiddler on the Roof was my favorite, and my theme song was, was Tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's a big political issue about yes. the Jews in Russia. The scariest movie I ever remember, I was in high school, early high school, probably freshman in high school, and I went to see The Thing. Absolutely. And they just couldn't kill that thing. <laughs> I know. And I went to bed that night, and I was screaming and yelling, and my stepfather and mother jumped up and came running in, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I said, The Thing, The Thing is going to get me. <laughs> we can't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and, you that's know, the only time I heard that kind of thing. And it feeling. was humanoid. In a, you, know, you know who played The Thing, right, as a bit of trivia here. Uh, that was the cowboy uh, actor in t television. James uh, Arness. James Arness. Yes. Yeah. And it's referred to in the film as an intellectual carrot because you can chop it and cut it, and of course he just grows the limbs back. That's it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's a classic, and we showed it twice, and we had one of the co-stars on both showings from the movie at the Chamizo. Oh, wonderful! Uh, Robert Nichols, who we lost last year, but okay. he was, he, and he was also in Giant, you mm -hmm. know. So he had stories to tell about Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean and Rock Hudson. So this was a lot of fun and, and kind, of, kind of being on the inside in a sense, hearing firsthand stories right. of some of the people that were involved in, in the making of these films. Exactly. Now, what films are you lining up for the future? People calling in mm -hmm. and checking your website. What are some things coming up? Well, the next one will be a special St. Patrick's Day family matinee at 12 noon on Sunday, March 15th. Uh, and this is going to be interesting in, in several aspects. I think a lot of people are familiar with the Disney classics. When you hear Snow White or Pinocchio or Fantasia mm -hmm. or C Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, the animated classics, or even the live action ones like Treasure Island, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, they say, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, you mentioned Darby O'Gill and the Little People, and some of them say, I uh, must have missed that one. And this is from 1959. Um, has to do with this wily caretaker uh, in Ireland, mm, last century, well actually 19th century, uh, who tells tales of knowing the leprechaun king, you know, and uh, he likes to uh, regale his stories to the inhabitants of the pub and so forth, and they all think he's daft, and so he isn't. He isn't. Now what's interesting about this film is that there's no computer generated effects in 1959 and so to get the illusion of a normal sized person walking among a horde of leprechauns uh, is, is totally amazing and it was all done through forced perspective, uh, outsized props that were constructed, um, split screen and so forth and all the physical special effects that were used in, in the day before computers. And what's interesting too about the film is that there's this young fellow, good looking guy, and whatever happened to Sean Connery? Oh, uh, <laughs> he became his, very famous. <laughs> this was his first starring role mm -hmm. and um, three years before Dr. No. Okay. And this was the film that brought him to the attention of Albert Broccoli, the producer of the James Bond movies. Uh, and it was through uh, Mr. Broccoli's wife in seeing Darby O'Gill that said, that's James Bond. <laughs> Talk to him. <laughs> and so he did, and of course the rest is history. But that's coming up on March 15th. In April, I'm still <coughs> toying with the idea because that will represent our first anniversary at Ardovino's Desert Crossing. Okay. And. Um, in May, uh, who knows? But I think, you know, we, we've had such a representative of classics in all genres, from Shane to The General uh, with Buster Keaton to uh, Charlie Chaplin's Gold Rush to uh, Sunset Boulevard to Last Father's Day we showed on Father's Day To Kill a Mockingbird, which was voted the, um, the best father figure in film history by the American Film Institute. So there's always going to be something, I think, and hopefully something good, and um, you know, it's usually 
um, unless there's a conflict in some way with Artavino's the third Sunday at noon um, at Artavino's Desert Crossing in Sunland Park, New Mexico. Okay. But we'll certainly keep you apprised on what's coming up on the website. And when you visit it, you'll not only read about the film, but you'll also see additional images, some behind the scenes, lot for Darby O'Gill. Mm -hmm. um, amazing things. And we always try to make it a full movie going experience the way it used to be. No commercials uh, for Coke and various products, you know, which we went to the movie theater normally to escape television, which were showing commercials. And now, of course, you know, there's commercials <coughs> and tr th previews of coming attractions. So we'll always either have a, like a serial chapter, a cartoon, a featurette. In the case of Darby, we'll have uh, an 11 minute uh, behind the scenes look at little people, big effects, and how they did some of the stuff, which is really fascinating. Are you bothered by what's happened to movies with computerization? Well, <clears throat> you know, I try to be liberal enough to realize it's a tool uh, and it's not replacing. Um, but it's hard to sometime when it's like, you know, wow them with the sizzle and once you cut past all of that, there's no stake. You know, in other words, it's a $200 million <laughs> budget, looks fabulous, you see things that wow you and you think, yeah, but I've seen that story before and done better. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, it's a, it's a remake of a superior film or a sequel to a superior film or just kind of a lame idea bolstered by a lot of visuals. Mm -hmm. And so I think the storytelling and the acting, in some cases, is missing, mm -hmm. you know, to a lot of the, the current films. Uh, my wife, Shanna Blevins, she worked with deaf children for years and then she retired and then she taught at Jesus Chapel School for a few years. <laughs> she taught speech and drama and English and so on. And she would show a black and white film and the students would complain. Mm -hmm. They just grew up with color. Right. They, they had, trouble focusing their attention on black and white films. And she liked to show Robin Hood and some of those older versions mm -hmm. in black and white. Mm -hmm. What about that? You know, that's an interesting point because when we, uh, <coughs> we first did our, it came from the 50s, um, a lot of the classic films were black and white. Um, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Thing, Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, and we thought, It'll be interesting to see how young people react to that. And, you know, you had, you had three generations of families coming. Right. So you had the baby boomers that saw the films originally and then their children and their grandkids and they made it kind of a, a family event. And you could hear a pin drop. And afterwards I asked some of the young people, I said, did the lack of color bother you? Did you feel something was missing? They said, no. He said it was the storytelling. You know, it, I was captured into the storytelling and the acting and I didn't even notice it wasn't in color, <laughs> you know. And I thought that's encouraging because it shows the power of the script mm -hmm. and the story, um, which I think uh, once you have that, you can, you can embellish it with Technicolor, like the War of the Worlds or This Island Earth um, or widescreen like Forbidden Planet, which is just an ad adaptation of Shakespeare's The Tempest, so they're going from, they're going to a pretty good source to get the storyline, you know. Right. But I was, I was pleasantly surprised and uh, surprised by the, uh, by the young people saying, no, I didn't miss it at all. Mm -hmm. So I guess it depends on the, the setting, the environment too, because you're in there in a packed 500 seat theater, <laughs> and as you know, comedies are funnier in a full house. Mm -hmm. uh, mysteries and suspense films are scarier or horror uh, and it's contagious. It's a social kind of a, a event where you kind of feed off the electricity I think of, of the people around you and you can see whatever your favorite comedy is by yourself at home and you might chuckle but you're not going to let her rip like you would in a movie theater I think you know. Yeah, when I was young, a preteen, lived some in Los Angeles, California and go to the theaters there, Lowe's and some of those big fancy theaters and the glamour of it, and that's what I like about the Plaza Theater being brought back. Yes. Because it shows that part of the movie going experience. It's not just what's on the screen, but it's also the ambience of the place where it's you are. It's an atmospheric theater, so it's, it all adds to 
the enjoyment of the film, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a multiplex, right. and, it's, and you don't hear something seeping in through the wall. The right. walls. From feel the earthquake from the neighboring movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, 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 you know, they were built for that. And, and that's what's so unique and something to be heralded in El Paso. It's got one of probably maybe eight, if that many, left mm -hmm. in its original, intact. You know, of course, it's been brought up to code, and, yeah, but it didn't destroy the ambiance and the, uh, the fine line art on the ceiling. And, you know, of course, they've added an elevator for the disabled and so forth. But it's something that we should really be crowing about, I think, as a performance arts theater and for the largest classic film festival on the planet. Right. Which is held once a year. Several years ago, Shannon and I were involved in National Society of Arts and Letters National Convention. And uh, so we had a tour set up for the delegates that came in from all over the country. And part of that trip for them was over to the Plaza Theater, just across from the um, sure. hotel they were in downtown. And they were really taken aback, yeah. looking up there and hearing the birds tweet and, all <laughs> right. this and seeing the twinkling stars up on the ceiling. And this was, they gave us big compliments of, of taking them over there and letting them see that and when it was not open for other activities. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they were leaving talking about this great thing that we have in El Paso, Texas. It's, it's truly one of, I think, um, one of the real majestic landmarks of the city. Uh, and we so all, all should be so pleased that, uh, that it's here. And send a thanks to Janice Wendell and all of those others Absolutely. that worked so hard Absolutely. to get it there and save it for us. Because there were times, you know, even when it was in its heyday, and I was growing up going there all the time, you know, in the 50s and 60s, um, that a lot of people, because El Paso is not one community, you know, it's uh, northeast, mm -hmm. central, you know, west side, downtown, so forth, uh, and it's kind of hidden in a corner. And if you look at it just from the entrance, it looks like a little yeah. nothing. It doesn't look like a theater. It doesn't look like it's a block and a half long right. or deep. <laughs> and and I think, you know, we were always pleased, you know, and, and of course during the Plaza Classic too, people would walk in and you could immediately tell as people entered that they were coming in for the first time because they would be doing wow, this okay. and they, their jaw would be bouncing off the floor <laughs> and, you know, they were, they were completely pleasantly overwhelmed at uh, what's here in El Paso. Okay, we know that you're not going to have a plaza theater for your productions take place. Art of Venus is not quite the same. Right. But we do know that there's great leadership in you in bringing these films in, and so we look forward to seeing some of these in the near future. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank being here, Thank you so Jay. much for the opportunity to be with you. You're quite welcome. And that's another program we call Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins. Tune in for another program in the future.